morning, Marta. Morning, Marta. Good morning. It's just you and me today, by the looks of things. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, folks, it's eight o'clock. Um, one thing I forgot to, to mention when we were talking about the colligative properties was the Van Hoff factor. I forgot to, to mention that. This is not something that's going to be part of the test. It's, if you remember what colligative properties are, they depend upon the number of particles, not necessarily the number of, um, of, of what, not necessarily what is actually dissolved. But um, the way that the Van Hoff, Van Hoff factor works is it is used to account for ionic compounds. And there are some questions in the fun quiz that have to do with the Van Hoff factor. So what I would recommend you do is for the fun quiz that you read about the Van Hoff factor. And the Van Hoff factor here is an I value that goes in front of all these different equations that we learned about for the colligative properties. So the Van Hoff factor is only used when dealing with ionic compounds and it's, it turns out to be the number of ions that something breaks apart into. So we've done a lot of this before, back when we did the, back when we did the uh, soluble, soluble salts, we did that, partly soluble salts, and we also did it when we were looking at um, entropies as well, if you remember. So Na2CO3, the I would be three because it splits into two sodiums and one carbonate. ALCl3, I is four because it splits into one Al and three Cl minuses. And HBr would be I equals two because it splits into one H and one Br. So uh, that's something you need to take into account, but you'll only see these kinds of questions when dealing with the extra credit quizzes 
I'm not going to have any of these Van Hoff questions on the actual test. Okay, so we're going to look here at uh, the coordination chemistry. And coordination chemistry is the chemistry of metals and what they attach to. So what we have in a coordination compound is generally a metal, and then a metal will be covalent, uh, uh, coordinately bonded to a coordinate, covalently bonded to a uh, to a ligand. So that's what these things are called that are joined to the metal. They're called ligands or ligands, depending on where you're from. And we have the strong field and weak field ligands that we're going to be talking about. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. But in this instance, whatever is inside the square brackets is going to be connected to the metal. So let's talk about what I mean, first of all, by a coordinate bond. When we've got a cobalt and let's say it's bonding to an ammonia, Ammonia looks like this as a Lewis structure, and it's important to note that it has a non-bonding electron pair. Now, the non-bonding electron pair, the entire thing, is used to bond to the cobalt. So the cobalt is actually not donating any electrons to this bond, which makes, makes this what's called a coordinate covalent bond, because one of the species is not donating any electrons to the actual bond. So there are two electrons involved in the bond and those are the ones in, on the nitrogen there. Does anybody have any questions so far? So there's two coordination setups we're going to be looking at. Uh, one is called octahedral because there are going to be six things around the metal. The other one is tetrahedral and that's where there's going to be four things around the metal. So let's look at, first of all, this example here where we have six things around the metal. We've got five NH3s and one CN. This list here is something you'll have access to. So you don't have to, you have to memorize any of this. And this will allow you to know what the charges on each of these ligands is going to be. This is going to be important because in the end, it's going to be able to tell you what the charge on the metal is going to be as well. So this is the setup for this specific compound here. So you'll have the CO and there's going to be six things around it. Now, if there's six things around it, then what's going to happen is that there's going to be an octahedral shape to the, to the complex. So this whole thing is going to be called a coordinate complex or a, or a metal complex, if you will. Now there's going to be five NH3s now I'm being very deliberate about this. You'll notice it's the nitrogen that's bonding to the metal because that's where the electrons are. And you'll notice I'm doing the same thing over here too. I'm making it H3N because the N is bonding to the cobalt. And then we'll have CN over here. So the, the way I want you to, to visualize this is to have the NH3 here that is going back into the page and the CN is coming out of the page. Now I'm going to, I'm going to go hunt down an octahedral, octahedral geometry here. And I'll show you exactly what that looks like. There we go. So you can see it there. And what I've tried to do here is represent this situation in two dimensions. So you can see this is going back into the page. This is coming out of the page. That would be the NH3 and this one here would be the CN. Does anybody have any questions about visualizing this shape? Why right. is it called an octahedral? It's called octahedral because, actually I'll show you here. If you, if you look at each of these faces, they're equilateral triangles and there's four faces on the top because it's a it's essentially a square pyramid and on the bottom we have another square pyramid joined to at its base and it has four faces as well so there's a total of eight faces and that's where the octa comes into play 
Is that okay? Okay, and then can you go back to your um, lecture sheet page? Which, I was trying to see which uh, example you were making that off of. Oh, okay, this one. Cool. So, You don't use the CN or the BR, I guess I don't understand. No, no, the CN is here. I haven't put the BRs on yet. Oh, in a second. But there's, a, there's your CN there, Katie. Okay, so what's the purpose of the H3N? Well, it's the N has to be connected to the CO, so I have to arrange it. So the N is bonded to the CO and not one of the H's. But I haven't completed the diagram yet. I am now though. Oops. I should use my pad here. Oh, the mouse. So there you go. So that's a completed diagram there. It doesn't matter which it doesn't matter which one the CN goes on. It can go on any of them. It's going to be equivalent regardless of where the CN is placed. Is that okay, Katie? Yeah, I guess I just like, I'm curious how, essentially, I guess if it's, if the line's on the other side, you're saying we have to change the. Yeah, you have to change the orientation to make it so that the N is actually joining on to the CO. You can't just make it NH3 because that looks like the hydrogen's bonding to the CO, but it isn't. Okay. Do you see, that's why it can't be NH3 on that side. I've been very deliberate about that. You'll see that I've joined in each case to the end. It was easier for the ones on this side, obviously, but and the ones up and down. All right, let me let me see how you're feeling about this so far. How are you feeling about it so far? Five. Four, three, two, one. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's cobalt. That's right. So on the CN, it bonds to the carbon. That's right. Oh yes, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, so CN bonds to the carbon of the CN. That's right, I see what you're saying, Kate. I understand where you're going with that. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, how would you know that? Well, you probably wouldn't, but it's uh, it does bond through the C. So in each of these cases, I mean, I can tell you what they bond through. The C, CN minus bonds through the C, the NO2 bonds through the N, EN we haven't talked about yet, but it bonds through the nitrogens, and you'll see what that is in, the, in a bit. The NH3 bonds through the N, the H2O bonds through the O, the OH minus bonds through the O, and these just bond by themselves. But that doesn't really make a difference, right? For us to it, know. It, well, it kind of does when you, well, it kind of does if you're going to draw them, yeah. Okay. Right, because if you're going to draw the, with the NH3 here, you've got to make sure that each N is bonded to the metal. So for these, it does kind of matter, but it really won't matter for you because I'm not going to ask you to draw anything on the test, but I'll, I'll show you in a bit what those questions look like. You guys get kind of get off a bit easier than people who are taking your regular class because on a regular test, I would actually make you draw it. I'd actually make you get it right in order to get the points. But, uh, you know, you kind of get away with this a little bit, not having to worry about it. So technically, no, you don't have to worry about it, but Technically, yes, I want you to. Right, any other questions so far? So we've got the two BRs on the outside and they each have a negative one charge, as you can see from this list. If each of those is negative one, that means the total outside charge is negative two, which makes the charge on the entire complex plus two. Now this enables us to be able to calculate the charge on the central atom because we already know what the charges are on each of the ligands. So what I can say is that the total of everything in those square brackets is going to be CO plus five times zero, which is the 
charge on an NH3, as you can see here, there's no charge on it, plus negative one, which is a charge on the CN. All of that adds up to two plus, which means CO must be plus three in this example. Remember, these are transition elements, so they're going to have different charges depending upon the situation they happen to be in. This one happens to be three plus or plus three. It doesn't matter how you put it. Does anybody have any questions about that? How do you feel about the charge on the cobalt? How do you feel about the charge on the cobalt? Five, four, three, two, one. Come on, everybody needs to vote. All right, so I can yeah, can still see if a portion of you still do not understand that. Can can I can I get some questions here, please? So how do you know that it needs to add up to five? Because obviously, if we know that, oh no, it doesn't add up to five. It adds it adds up to two, which is what's on the outside here. See, all of these, all these things have to add up to whatever charge is on the entire complex, whatever's in the square brackets. Um, I don't think you understand that though. Okay, so because you're saying it'd be, BR would be two minus, so the inside. Yes. That's right. And that means that whatever's in the square brackets must be totally plus two, right? No, I don't understand. Okay, so the BR, each, each one of those is negative one, which makes that entire business negative two, which means that whatever's in the square brackets must be plus two to balance it out. But you said it was, CO is three. It is, but the plus two here is on the entire thing in the square brackets. And what I did was I was calculating the charge on the cobalt by using the charges on the ligand. Do, do you understand where the two plus comes from? Um, okay, I'll say it again. BR is negative, that BR is negative. So the total charge on the outside of the square brackets is negative two, which means mm -hmm. everything inside the square brackets must be plus two to balance it out. Okay. Can you accept that, plus two? I then? can accept that, yeah. Okay. So that means that we can then calculate the charge on the cobalt because we already know the charges of everything that's in the square brackets except the cobalt. Now the ammonias are zero charge and the CN is a negative one charge. So okay. that's Okay, so to equal it out, then it would yes, be three. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We're okay. solving, we're solving the cobalt. It's just algebra right here at this point. It's not chemistry, it's algebra. Okay. All right, any other questions about that? Okay, I think that clears it up for people. Now I'm gonna show you an example of, this is an example of a tetrahedral structure. Let me, let me see if I can show you what tetrahedral looks like in three dimensions. Now remember the, the whole, whole point of what I'm drawing here is that if you have six things around a central object and you want them to be as far apart as possible from each other, then this is how you would arrange them. If you've got four things, and you can always tell how many things you've got attached because it'll be obvious whatever's in the square brackets, the tetrahedral geometry. There we go. There we go. That's, that's tetrahedral geometry there. And generally speaking, it'll be something like this. You'll have a metal and then you'll have ligands attached to it. And in two dimensions, you'll represent it like this. Now these wedges and dashes are trying to indicate what's coming in and out of the page. So 
So the X here is this one, the X down here is this one. And these two X's are the ones that are coming in and out of the page. So both of these X's are in the plane of the page. This one's coming in and this one's going out. And this is how we represent it in two dimensions. Okay, so that's the tetrahedral geometry there. Does anybody have any questions? We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So going back to the kinds of questions that, that you're going to be asked here, you're going to be asked questions about isomers, which I'll talk about in a second, and also about splitting diagrams are going to deal with all sorts when things get a little bit more involved. And we'll get to that in a second. It looks complicated, but it actually isn't as bad as it looks. All right, so I'm going to give you some examples here of isomerism within these kinds of structures. Now, isomers, what are isomers? The word isomers, isomers have the same molecular formula but different structures. I'll give you an example, and this comes from organic chemistry of isomerism. So if you've got the formula C2H6O, there are two ways that you can draw that structure if you just have the molecular formula. You can draw it like this. Or you can draw it like this. And both of those have the same formula. They still have two carbons, six hydrogens, and one oxygen, but they're different structures. That makes them isomer. That's uh, so that's what I mean by isomers. Does anybody have any questions so far? I'm not even going to ask if people understand that because I know that there's a bunch of people who will say they don't. Uh, but you know, that's but I'm I'm trying to. This is a this is as simple as I can explain it. Unfortunately. So let's look at the three ways that we can talk about isomers here. The first one is called exchanging anions. And this is okay if we're talking about taking a structure and then as long as there's something with a negative charge in the square brackets, then it could be switched with a negative charge on the outside. So, but, but I can't exchange the NH3s, for example, because they're neutral. But I can exchange a Br negative for a Cn negative. And you can see how that works over here. That would be a possible way that I could have isomerism here. So both of these have the same molecular formula, but they have different, different ways of stru being structured, the Cn and the Br. Cn minus and the Br minus can be switched out. So that is one way that I can make an isomer of the compound I originally had. These two things are the same, by the way. The Cn just in a different place. All right, how do you feel about exchanging anions here? How do you feel about exchanging anions? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, that's good. Does anybody have any questions? I do, but I don't know if that's that's the right time like to ask that. But I was looking through the like extra credit uh, quiz on that topic, and I saw that sometimes, um, uh, that like let's say the br would be like in front of the square bracket, and sometimes it's after. Like, does it make a difference? 
Well, it does here. I mean, you, you mean, I mean, if it's before or after the square bracket? Yeah. Not really, no. Okay. Uh, but generally speaking, I mean, if we're going to be writing these out, we usually put the cation first and the anion second. So you might have been seeing Ks or something in front. Yeah. Not necessarily BRs. But the K would be positive. You couldn't, you can't have, uh, you can't exchange anions in that case. So the positives are always in front of the bracket? Generally, generally. And then generally. the bracket would be negative in that case. Okay. Uh, we haven't seen an example of that yet, but we will later. Okay, thank you. The, the next kind of isomerism is called a positional or geometric isomerism. And this structure here is called square planar. So if you're in a big square here, and you'll notice that in the in this position, the CLs are adjacent to each other 90 degrees apart. And in this example, the CLs are 180 degrees apart. So that makes them that makes them different. So those are two isomers as well. Now that's a bit more subtle. That kind of isomerism is a little bit harder to see, but it is definitely still a form of isomerism. Does anybody have any questions about that? I'll show you more examples of that in a bit. Now, the last one here is called optical isomerism. And this will only occur under very, very strict circumstances. First of all, it can occur when something is tetrahedral, but there has to be four different things attached to the central element. Now, I know this is going to be a little bit hard to uh, hard to fathom, but uh, the, the story is that if you've got four different things attached to a central element and you take the mirror image, and you can see what I've done there by taking the mirror image. There's a, it looks like there's a mirror in the front here. I put the Ks on the outside just to, I don't know, just to make the, um, it, they really should be on the other side, Marta. I think you, that's kind of what you're asking about. It doesn't really matter that much. But uh, the, if you take the mirror mirror image of these, it's they're non-superimposable, meaning I can't I can't shift them around um, to make them match. So let me let me show you let me show you that here. I have this video about this. And I think it's well worth watching. Let's see, structures and isomers. All right, let me uh, change this a bit. Talk about some coordination that is to use what cobalt is and all the I and there's your purples and the reds are both pointing to the back and this is Okay, yes. so now what this indicates here, this uh, dash line indicates that the BR is sticking back into the screen and this indicates the CL is pointing to the front. Now we take the mirror image and now I want to convince you that the mirror image is actually a little bit different to what we started with. It actually turns it into a different compound. So here's an example, very similar. Let's pretend this is the chromium, then we've got the four other atoms attached to it. And this would be its mirror image. Now, here's what I want you to see. If the mirror is down the middle here, there you go. There's the mirror image. There's your greens. There's your purples. And the reds are both pointing to the back. And the whites are both pointing to the front. Now, what we can do is let me turn, let me turn this around 180 degrees. Now, what I want you to see is that if I tried to line this up together, I could get the greens and the purples to line up, but now the reds and the whites will not line up. That's what makes these a little bit different. Now, this is a very subtle form of isomerism. The only way you can tell these two things apart is to put them into a special device called a polarimeter and to see which way they rotate plane polarized light. That's it. That's the only way you can really tell the difference between these two. And like I said, the only time this happens is when you've got four different things attached to a central atom. That won't happen at any other time uh, in this sort of arrangement. Let me. All right.
right. So uh, that's uh, that's what I that that's what optical isomerism is. All right. Dare I ask? Okay. How do you feel about optical isomerism? Do you understand how it's isomerism? I guess is my question. How do you feel about it? How do you feel about optical isomerism? Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, somebody's not voting. There you go. All right, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Now there's one other instance where we can possibly have uh, optical isomerism. And that is when we've got an octahedral, but we've got EN ligands mm -hmm. instead of instead of uh, ligands that are well, what we call monodentate. These are bidentate ligands. So EN looks like this. This is the EN that I'm going now. So it's NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2. So it's got one N on each end. So when it joins to a metal, it always joins like this. So it's like 90 degrees apart. It's called a bidentate again, you know, dense for teeth, two teeth. That's what that's what's meant by that, bidentate. The, all the other ligands are called monodentate, one tooth. These are these have two teeth. So the representation of this that you'll usually see just to sort of shorten it out, it's like this. EN, like that. Okay, that's the, that's what EN means. So when, when you do that for something like nickel, nickel with three ENs on it, it actually can have a different mirror image as well. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you in the video what that looks like. I have a question really yeah. quick. Mm -hmm. So how do you know that it's an EN? Oh, because it the it'll be in the it'll be in the formula like n i e n three like that oh okay c l three for example that that would that might be the that might be okay it, and that's that's where the e n would be okay thank you since it's by dente there's only three of them three times two is six so we know it's octahedral Okay. So I'll show you, I, in that, I show you the other one as well. Let me see if I can, there we go. I've already got that. That's the end there. All right. So this next part is showing you how the mirror images are different. Like and we've got three ENs attached to a nickel it's still in a uh, it's still in an octahedral type arrangement and there they are and what i've done is i've drawn them as mirror images now what i want you want you to see is we've got uh we've got a we've got one here between and this is going to be in the plane of the screen and then we've got another one here pointing backwards and that bond is in the plane of the screen that one's pointing back and then we've got another ethylene diamine at the front. See? All right, this one's a mirror image. And you've still got this one at the front, you've got this one at the back. Sorry, this one's at the back, and you've got this one in the plane of the screen. And that matches this one over here. So these two are actually mirror images of each other. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift this around 180 degrees. And I want you to be convinced that these two will not line up when you try and line them up. Now you can get these two to line up. These are in the plane of the screen and you can get those to line up. But look at the ENs here. This one's at the front and now this one's at the back. You're not going to get those to line up. And this one's at the back. See this one here? That's at the back. And this one's at the front. 
So you're not going to get those to line up either. So those are also stereo. Yeah, so those are stereo isomers as well. Uh, let me see a whole. Uh, that one's a that one's a tougher one to uh, to get a grasp on. How do you feel about that? And the ENs and the and have their stereo isomers. One, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, so that's, that those are the three kinds of isomerism we're going to be talking about, but we'll get to those in a, a little bit. The next thing we're going to be looking at will be the the d orbital splitting. Now, when you've got a metal ion or any metal that's in the d block, uh, it's going to have these five d orbitals. Now, you know this. This is going to come back to something that we talked about. Well, maybe we didn't talk about it, but you would have hopefully talked about it back in general chemistry one depending on hopefully that you would have done it. But I'm gonna give you an example. Let's, uh, let me try and pull up a periodic table here. Actually, what I'll do, I'll pull up, uh, let's see, I'll pull up another instance of this, is what I'll do. I'm pulling this up so I can get a copy of the periodic table. There we, there we go here. There's it. There's our periodic table. Now the metals we're talking about are these in the D block, 20 through 30. So if I wanted to take, I'll take Fe for as an example. No, let's do CO. We'll do CO as an example. The electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. 2p6, 3s2, uh, 3p6, 4s2, 3d7. So remember that's the s block, we got the p block over here, and then we've got the d block in the middle. How well, how well do you remember this? How well do you remember this? Yeah, I'm guessing the don't understand at all has never never seen it before, which is unfortunate. That's a real deficiency. Yeah. That's a real deficiency in how you were taught, unfortunately. I um I think that's uh I think that's really rough. Okay, so we've got the S block, we've got the, the P block over here, we've got the D block. The S has started one, the P started two, the D started three. We've got the, the, P, the S block here, one S2, then we've got two S2, then we've got two P6, counting across here, six, 
3s2 and 3p6 and 4s2 and then the the thing to understand is we've got 3d7 that's one two three four five six seven All right. and look i'm sorry the reality is when you when you enter this class i assume certain things and one of the things I assume is that you've seen and are very familiar with electron configurations. I apologize for that, but that's how, that's how this is. We're only really interested in the 4S2 and the 3D7. It turns out these are actually very close in energy. And when we look at these and we do the electron configurations, I'm not going to show the rest of it, but the D block is consisting of five orbitals. And then we'll have the 4S orbital here. I'm drawing it above the 3D, but in reality in compounds, it's actually very much closer than that. Um, actually, I won't do that. I will I'll put it below since I have got it below here as well. We'll do that. They're very close. So we've got 4s2 and then 3d7. One, two, three, four, five, and that's six, and that's seven. So that's how we would fill up the electrons. So if you'll remember, we always fill from the bottom to the top. I'm not showing the rest of it here because it's not that important. And then when we get to a point where we have all equal energies, then we have to put one in at a time and then fill up the other two. So if you've never seen this before, this is going to be completely foreign to you. And I'm really sorry, but I don't have the time to go back and teach this from scratch. So if this is, this would be cobalt with no charge and not nothing, nothing connected to it. So no lig cobalt, no ligands. No cobalt, no ligands. So nothing connected to the cobalt. So it'd be just one straight shot. So that is, that's cobalt there. And so you can see all these D orbitals have these different designations. I'll show you what those look like in a second. But what happens is that when we do join ligands to it, what happens is the D levels split and they split in the manner shown in the diagram here. So the octahedral splits with three on the bottom and two on the top, and tetrahedral splits with three on the top and two on the bottom. All right, let's take a look at how that happens. So these are the d orbitals here. And if you remember what orbitals are, they're just basically volumes where we can expect to find electrons. So if they are areas where negative charge is tending to congregate. So we've got X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z. And you can see that if in, in these coordinate structures here, that the lobes where the electrons are, are in between, they're in between these axes, the X, Y, and Z axes. And in the other two cases, you'll notice that the electron lobes run along the axes. So when you've got an octahedral structure, what you're assuming is that you're going to have one ligand approaching from the end of each axis or both ends of each axis here. So that produces an octahedral structure. And you'll notice, now remember that ligands are going to be somewhat negatively charged because they're electron sources. So what's going to happen is when they're approaching along the axes, there's going to be more repulsion, which makes these higher energy and pushes those to a higher energy level than these, where the ligands are not, uh, they're approaching along the axes, but you'll notice that the lobes themselves are not on the axes. So there's less repulsion, which makes these three lower energy. All right, I'm going to ask how you feel about that. Be honest. I'm not expecting a whole lot of understanding here, but I'll, uh, I'll give it a go anyway. How do you feel about what I've explained so far about the splitting of these energy levels?
Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, any questions? Well, obviously people must have questions. Come on. So so when it's uh, six uh, things attached to the metal, it's always gonna be the octahedra and it's always gonna be in that position where there's three and two at the top. That's the right, deeper. yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, but the, the rationale for that is because the, the lobes, they represent where the electrons are on the metal. And when you've got electrons, approaching negative charges or negative charges approaching electrons, it's always going to lead to repulsion, which leads to higher energy. Okay. But yeah, that's exactly how it's going to be. Now, in the case of tetrahedral, it's the opposite. So tetrahedral, you've got four things attacking and they're attacking in between the axes. I have case. a question. Yes, Alexandra. Sorry. So the octahedral is two at the top, three at the bottom, right? Yes, yes. And the tetrahedral is three at the top, two at the bottom? Yes. Okay, right. and that's like all we kind of really have to know and understand? Pretty much. Okay. But, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of context to explain why it's three up the top and two on the bottom in this case, and two on top and three on the bottom of the other one. It's okay. got to do with how the ligands approach the metal and where the, and where the electron lobes are in the, in the orbitals themselves. So in the case of the tetrahedral, you can see you've got DXY, DXZ, DYZ. Those are all, those electron lobes are all in between the axes and the ligands are approaching between the axes as well. And that leads to higher repulsion where, whereas the ones that are along the axes are not experiencing quite as much repulsion. So the, this one has three up the top and two on the bottom. But yeah, you're right, Alexander, that's all. In fact, you don't even really have to know that at all. I actually give you the actually give you this diagram on the test, <laughs> so it makes it a little bit easier. But I, I, you know, I can't just give it to you without giving you some sort of context as to to why it is what it is. Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. See, I actually give you that. Look at that. But it gives you an idea, at least, of of, uh, of what's what you what you're doing with it. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? I know a lot of people didn't really understand that, but there's a video about it. I'd recommend you watch the video. I do. If you um, if you're still unsure about what's going on here. I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On that ungraded copy, was that a question? Like all of that writing where it says image left right. No, 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 no. What that is, it's a. It, it's it's this put into words, Alexandra. Oh, okay. It's for it's for blind students if they if they were doing this. Don't don't even begin to imagine what it would like be to, what it would be like doing this blind. But uh, it's to, it's an accessibility thing. I have to do it just in case oh, okay. a blind student takes this test. Right. If I don't do it, then I get in trouble. Just keep that in mind. All right, I know it's a bit of an annoyance, but that's the, it's an annoyance to sighted students, but that's, that's the reason it's there. If you, if you read it, you can see they're just verbal descriptions of the, the diagram here. Now the questions though, they start down here. This is a question down here. And I'll, I'll show you how we handle these in a minute, okay? It's actually not too bad. You guys get off very easy because I can't make you draw anything for that test. All right, so we have strong field and weak field ligands. So when we've got Fe3+, plus, and I'll, I'll show you how we get the, the five electrons there, but if you've got Fe3+, plus, First of all, let's look at what Fe is. Fe is 1s2, actually, let me show you this. <clears throat> 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 
And then it would be 3D6, so it's number 26. So all you're really interested in is this part 4S2, 3D6, the rest of it really doesn't matter that much. So again, I'll, I'll do the do the thing here. We've got 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3D. And then we've got two electrons in the 4S and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6. I just have a really quick question. Mm -hmm. I know you can't like reteach this or anything, but I'm like starting to understand it and I'll just teach it to myself. But where you're doing the 3D and the 4S in the second part, is it always five lines for the 3D and one line for the 4S? Yes, because the 4S, this is the S block over here, Alexander. Uh -huh. There's two columns, you see them? Yeah. That means there's two electrons and there's two electrons per orbital. Each of these lines represents okay. an orbital. Now in the D block, you'll notice there's 10. What's 10 divided by two? Five. Five, that's why there's five lines here in the D block. So for the P block, since there's six, it would be three lines? Yeah, okay. okay that's cool. right. What about, the, what about the F block down here, Alexandra? How many lines would that be? I don't even know how many is in that. 14. Okay, eight. <laughs> Seven. Seven. <laughs> 14 divided by two is seven, right? That'd be, okay. seven, that'd be seven lines. Thank are you. you. Are you okay with putting, with how I put the electrons in though? If it's, yeah. if, they're all the, uh -huh. if they're all the same energy and I'm doing six, it goes like that, right? Yeah. Now, Fe3 plus, and this is, what happens is that's Fe and we lose three electrons. Now, which electrons do we lose? Well, the 4S electrons are the first to go. I know that they're not the highest energy or don't appear to be the highest energy, energy but they are the ones that are first to go. So the 4S electrons are the first to go. And what that means is that we're left with 3D, five. So we got 4s2 and 3d6. We lose the two 4s electrons. It's 4s2 electrons are the first to go. And one of the d electrons. And that means 3d5, which means Fe3 plus is going to be five electrons. Okay, so I know I know you don't, I know that all of you don't understand the the basis of this, but I want to make sure you understand what I just did here. First of all, how I know we're losing three electrons, and that's because of the charge, right? That's why the charge on this is important. The 4S electrons are the first two electrons to go, and then we lose one of the D electrons, which means we have five D electrons left. That I, that I have to have you understand. All right, so how do you feel about that, the fact that Fe3 plus is 3D5. That's all I want you to understand here based on what I just said. I have a question. Yeah. So um, for a majority of the questions on the test, are they going to be around that same area? Yes. Yeah, they'll, oh. they'll all be in that same row. Okay, cool. Thanks. Right. And you, you can always know Yeah, most people are understanding that, that's good. You can always know how many D electrons there originally are because you see how this is 21 through 30? That's one through 10. So if it was nickel, it's easy, it's eight. Vanadium, it's three, right? It's just whatever the second digit is for the atomic number. That's how many D electrons there are originally. And then you have to sort of figure out that from the charge, how many D electrons are gonna be left. All right, let me, uh, let me go back to here. So the, the way that the D, or at least the, the difference in these, uh, in these D orbitals when they're split is going to be entirely determined by the ligand. And that's, what, that's where this list comes into play. We've got two kinds of ligands. They're called strong field and weak field. The strong field ligands 
are kind of down the left end and the demarcation point or the difference point I, I believe is between the N and the water. So these are strong field and these are, these are weak field down here. Now when, with this strong field, like if you've got six CNs, what happens is there's a very big energy difference between the two levels. And for the weak field, there's only a very small energy difference. Now you'll notice that both of these have five electrons in the Fe because they're both Fe3 plus as we just talked about here. So if it was Fe3 plus with nothing connected to it, we just have the five electrons that all be in a straight line. However, when we start connecting things to the Fe3 plus, that's when we get the splitting of the d orbitals. So the Cn, because it's strong field, has a very large energy difference. So when we put the electrons in, it goes like this. One, two, three, four and five. And that's because these are so high up that the extra electrons actually fill the bottom part of the Ds rather than going into the top. Now, when the energy difference is small, it's almost like these are in a straight line. So we put one in each. Now that's a tough, that's a tough one to understand. Let's see how you feel about that. I, 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 know, I know this one's tough. This one's tough, I get it. All right, how do you feel about this so far? Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, I was kind of expecting that. That's okay though. That's okay. Questions? So if you attach something from the strong field ligands, then the, uh, then basically they will combine in the bottom row and if it's yes. something from the weak field, okay. Yes, that's exactly how it goes. And of course you have access to this list, right? Yes. So you, you won't have to, you, you, you won't have to memorize that, but you will have to know where the demarcation point is. And that's when the, that's between the NH3 and the H2O. So that's where the, that's where the strong field begins and the weak field begins, or, you know, where they split up apart, when they split apart. But the, again, we're, we're just following Hund's rule here. So I'll, uh, I'm just going to show you here for the, for the strong field, again, how the electrons go in. So they go one, two, three, and then instead of going up here because this energy difference is so large, they go down here. But in the case of the, the, the weak field, it's almost, this is so small that we just put the electrons in one at a time. It's almost like they're in a straight line, just like we would if it was like this. I just have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said that NH3 is the like divider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is NH3? It's like, a, is it a strong one or a weak one? No, it's a strong one. Okay. Yeah. So like the first weak one is the H2O? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Again, if this is, if this is something you haven't seen before, this is going to be a bit of a struggle. If you've never seen electron configurations, it's, uh, it, this is going to be a bit of a struggle for you, I will admit. But I do assume, I do assume that knowledge. And I just think it's a, it's a real shame that whoever taught you Chem 1 didn't teach you this, didn't teach you electron configurations. That would be, that's, that is a pure tragedy, but that's not something I can control. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. All right, so let's look at some examples here. This is the example that we were initially talking about, the CONH35CNBR2. And these are the three things we want to be able to do with it. We want to be able to draw the complex and figure out the charge on the central ion, draw an isomer and use crystal field theory to determine how many unpaired electrons there are. So going back to going back to figuring out unpaired electrons, this, this is fairly easy. I'm hoping that in the first example, you can see there are five unpaired electrons. And in the other one, there's one unpaired electron. 
Is everybody okay with that? Does anybody have any questions? How do you feel about the way I counted unpaired electrons? How do you feel about the way I counted unpaired electrons in those examples? Okay, two people understand it halfway, so I don't know why. I need I need some questions here. How 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 people are counting the unpaired electrons? That's all I'm that's all I'm trying to do. All right. If you don't if you if you don't ask, I can't help. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. So we do the initial structure, which has CO with NH3, 5, CN, and we agreed earlier that the charge on cobalt is three plus. I showed you the calculation for that. So when we do cobalt, it's uh, 4S2, 3D7. The, the AR here is just a shortcut. That whole thing is argon. So we just do a shortcut for that, just so we're not doing that whole electron configuration thing for argon. And it would be 4s2, 3d7. So the 4s electrons are the first to go. So three plus, it means we lose the 4s electrons and we have 6d electrons. Now since it's strong field, and we know it's strong field because it's all ammonias and CN, so they're combinations. And one thing is I'll never give you a situation where it's where it's not obvious what it is. I'm never going to give you combinations of strong and weak field ligands. So it will be one or the other. So if it, this is octahedral, which means that it's going to be three on the bottom, two on the top, like I showed you over here. I have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did four electrons leave? This no, no, three did. did. Three, three did. Three. three. Treated. Four S, the four S electrons are the first to go. So we oh. lost two of those and one of these. Oh, okay, 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 I got you it. You got it? Yeah. Okay. So we've got six electrons and since it's strong field, they go one, two, three, four, five, six, and they all end up in here, which means there's zero one pet electrons. So that's the, that's what you have to understand about this. That, that's what you have to be able to do. So the main, the main things, you need to be able to get the charge, you need to be able to get the charge on the central element. You need to be able to identify isomers and you need to be able to figure out how many unpaired electrons there are in the, in the field splitting diagram. I know it's a, it's a tall order, but that's, uh, that's what you have to be able to do. Does anybody have any questions? All right, I'll show you, I'll show you some examples in a minute. It's, not, it's actually not as bad on the test as, as you think it might be. I wanna show you another example here with positional isomerism. So in this, in this one here, K2COCL4H2O2, we draw that by putting two Ks on the outside and then four CLs and two H2Os. There's the, there's the structure there. And here I've drawn it so that the H2Os are actually 90, 90 degrees apart. Sorry, 180 degrees apart. And if I wanted to draw an isomer of that, I could do that by making it so that the waters were 90 degrees apart. So that's positional isomerism right there. I know it's really subtle, but that's, that's how that is. Does anybody have any questions? I'll show you how the charge was obtained on the cobalt there. So you'll see that the Ks are both one plus, which means that whatever's in the brackets is two minus. So it's going to be CO plus four times negative one because the chlorines are all negative one or chlorides are all negative one. And then the waters are both zero on a charge and everything adds up to negative two. So we solve for the cobalt, it's going to be two plus.
remember that you'll have access to this list, which tells you what the charges are on each of the ligands. CL is negative one and water is zero. So that's how you'll know that. All right, let me know how you feel about the fact that the charge is, uh, yeah, the charge is CO2 plus. How do you feel about that? How do you feel? Can you give us the charges in the ligand? Y yeah, they're in the, yeah, they're in that list. They're in that list, so you don't have to memorize them. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, that's good. Okay, I'm glad that people understand that CO is two plus, that's good. So then CO would be four S two, three D seven. So four S two and then seven because it's 27, right? And then uh, the four S electrons are the first to go. So it's two plus. So we lose both four S electrons. We're left with seven electrons to put in. It's octahedral. So it's three on the bottom and two on the top. Remember you, you get that. You don't have to memorize that. Let me show you. Remember I have this in front. You'll have this in front of you in this diagram here. See, there you go, octahedral. Three on the bottom, two on the top. No memorization involved there. We've got seven electrons that need to go in. Now it's weak field because it's all CLs and waters. All right, and here's the, here's the list there. You can see all the CL and the H2O, they're all on the weak field side. So the electrons go like this, one, two, three, four, five, and then the other two electrons to make up the seven go in the bottom. That means there's three unpaired electrons in the weak field. All right, so how do you feel about there being three unpaired electrons in the weak field for this example? How do you feel about it? So the test questions will say though, are they gonna say whether it's a strong field or a weak field or we need to go reference to find out? You'll need to reference the list, the but list. the list will be given to you. All right, let's go through some of the questions that you'll see on the test. They're actually not that bad, really. So here's, here's an example. I know it looks nasty. It's actually not nearly as bad as it seems. It's like, I, I like to call it a, uh, a, a sheep in wolf's clothing. So, you know, it's a, it looks like a big wolf on the outside, but really it's just a little sheep in the middle, that's all. Okay, so we've got M, A, B, C, D, B, R, 2, and these are the ligand charges listed down here. So here's what you do. You look at it and you ask yourself, where is that list? That list hopefully. No. All right, I'm gonna to have to add the list in. I thought I had, but I, I guess I didn't. Uh, let me see. I might say, uh, here we go. All right, actually, you know what? Who asked me earlier about the, whether you know if it was strong field or weak field? Was that you, Alexandra? Or Katie, did you yeah, ask? I think it was me with the whole NH. Oh, I, actually, you know what? I actually do tell you. See, I actually tell you, you don't even have to, you don't even have to look at the list. That's it. That's how, that's how important the list is. All right. Okay. So let's look at this one here. M, A, B, C, D, B, R, 2. You would have to know B, R is negative one charge though. Because yeah, I guess you don't have a list, but you don't really need it. So if B, R is negative one, that means this whole thing is two plus, which means it's M plus negative one plus negative one plus negative one plus zero, all adds up to two, which means M would be, M would have to be five, right? It's 
So that would be the that would be the charge on the metal would be five. Any questions? How do you feel about M being five? Wait, I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So BR is a negative one charge. Yes. So it would add up to negative two. Yes. Like it would be M plus negative three equals negative two. No, no, because if BR is negative two total, right? It means everything in the square brackets is plus two to balance it out. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So it would equal the same number, but the opposite sign. Yes, because okay. it, it's ionic, right? These are ionic situations, which means the positives and negatives have to even out to be neutral, right? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that makes sense now. Okay. So the charge is five. Let me see how you feel about M being five. Close these blinds a little bit. My, they can actually still see me. I moved my table around a bit. I don't know if it was a good idea or not. Nah, I'm going to be washed out. All right, any, any questions? Uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, questions. Obviously, some people don't understand how M is five, so questions. All right. I got a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just so that I'm making sure that I understand that your M is five is because the, the, so where you're getting the two is from the two plus. That's right. So that's, so that's what you're trying. Okay, so that's where you're putting is your two plus comes from right where it says the two plus. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's equal to. Mm -hmm. So that's why everything in the parentheses or your um, parentheses. Um, so the M, A, B, C, D, that's exactly what you're trying to find that equals the two plus. So that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you've got the charges on A, B, C, and D. Okay. So you're just trying to find a charge on M that it has to be in order to make that happen. So that's what we're doing is trying to find M so that when you do it all, you get the two plus. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure that's because I was starting to get a little confused, but I just want to make sure that's actually what you're doing to find the M is five. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Now, when you've got K, M, A, B, C, D, D, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> K, M, A, B, C, D, then it's going to be, K is going to be one plus, and the rest of this is going to be one minus. So M plus zero plus negative one plus negative one plus negative one all has to add up to negative one. Uh, so that would be M would have to equal two. Any questions about that? I have a question. Yeah. Right? Negative. Negative one because K is one plus. Oh, so it's gotta be the opposite? Yes, because whenever you've got a neutral compound, and we know the charge on one side has to be the opposite charge on the other. Oh, okay. I mean, it's just like if you had, I mean, this is no different. If you had NaCl, Na is one plus, Cl is one minus. It is no different. Oh, okay. Absol absolutely no different. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about it? What would you do? Five, four, three, two, one. 
Okay. All right, any questions? For, for the elements that are outside of the parentheses, are mm. they going to be pretty standard ones that were in the Yes, new yes. Actually, it's like really only going to be one of two possibilities. It'll be something in group one, which will be one plus, plus or something in group seven, which is always going to be negative, two, negative one. And again, I don't want to go into why they're plus one and negative one. I mean, that's that's something from way back in intro to chemistry. But um, that's the that's going to be the situation. Again, I'm assuming some knowledge here. But not unreasonably so, in my opinion. Uh, the for the isomerism. We were on 27. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Oh, actually, we're on 27. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I probably won't get through this today, but that's okay. I'll, uh, what's, what's today? Today is uh, Tuesday. Right. Yeah. So Thursday, I, I will, um, I'll, I'll finish this up, but I'm still going to, I'll do this part with you. So, and the metal has an atomic number of 30 and its charge is plus two. How many D electrons does this metal possess? Okay. So that one is, what you'll do is you go up to, go up to the periodic table. The atomic number of 30, that would be zinc. And you can see that zinc is going to be, so Zn is 4s2, 3d10. Is everybody okay with that? Anybody have any questions? So the charge is, it says here, where are we? Here we go, the charge is two plus. So it's gonna be zinc two plus, which means it's going to be 3D10 because the S electrons are the first to go. And of course that would mean that it's all four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the, the question is how many D electrons does this possess? Well, it possesses 10, that's the, that's the answer. Anybody have any questions? Okay, so for like that question, we're gonna go on the periodic table look at which element has that atomic number and that's, that's right determine then, then, the number of electrons basically. yeah that's right and after you've taken out the s electrons for the charge yeah yeah that's right all right we're going to leave it there for today and i'll continue this on i'll continue this on uh, thursday okay so we'll leave it there for today all right, thanks for coming, folks. I'll see you all later. Have a good day. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Professor Musgrave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know this is a little out of place, but on the lab final, are we given the reduction potentials for like zinc or iron? For the voltaic cell sections? I think you'd have to be. Okay. Yeah, I think you'd have to be. Okay. All right. Any other questions?